It was um, overcast and somewhat drizzly that November morning in 1966 as we drove from the hotel to Parkland Hospital. A year or so earlier, Parkland had become closed to assassination interviews and investigations. It was, after all, a major hospital, and the assassination had become a kind of annoying sideshow for everybody there. But Life magazine meant something back then, even to Parkland Hospital. And so it hadn't been difficult for Patsy Swank and Holland McCombs uh, to arrange our visit. In the car, I checked the Polaroid camera, which I'd actually borrowed from my mother. I pulled it part way out of the bag and confirmed that it was loaded with a full packet of film. Then I quickly flipped through the manila folder of archive bullet photos. I knew how I wanted to do this, and I had what I needed. After almost 40 years, it's strange the tricks that uh, memory plays. I have no memory whatsoever of interviewing Daryl Tomlinson. And of course, we talked to him. Next slide, please. We talked to him because uh, I have these Polaroid photos of the gurney uh, next to the elevator. And right there, and there, you can see where we placed a bullet at Tomlinson's direction to simulate uh, where he had found the bullet on the gurney. So I know I talked to him, but I have absolutely zip memory at all as to what he said. Now the interview with O.P. Wright was something else. I would brought along bullet photos to show him because he could be expected to have an educated eye for bullets. I knew at that time that before becoming Parkland's security director, he'd been a Dallas police detective. That's all I knew, that he'd been a Dallas cop. What I didn't know at the time, but have learned since, was that Wright had been not just another Dallas cop, in fact, Wright had been deputy chief of police in charge of the patrol division in the mid-1950s. I remember White, Wright as a big man in a white shirt and a necktie, sitting at his desk in a small basement office. The room was small, and I remember sitting not across from him, but by his desk. And after a few inconsequential questions that I can't recall, I started working in the direction that I wanted to go. You know that bullet that you got from Tomlinson, I asked? The one you passed on to the Secret Service? What did it look like? Well, it was pointed, said Wright. And it wasn't messed up that bad. It was, you know, like that bullet that I gave you for the gurney. So I pulled out a yellow legal pad, put it on the desk, and drew three different kinds of bullet shapes. One was sort of pointed, like the 30 caliber unfired round that we'd used with the gurney. And the second, you know, had a, had a rounded tip, like 399. And the third was kind of squat, like a 38. Right pointed to the one with the pointed tip. I got a couple of photos here I'd like to show you, I hazarded, pulling the manila folder out of my case. Wright didn't say anything. I placed on his desk a black and white 8 by 10 of Commission Exhibit 606, 38 caliber projectiles. Next slide, please. And there they are, believe it or not, 606. Okay. No, not like those, right? Said they're 38s. I put out an 8x10 photo of Commission Exhibit 572. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the firearms ID rounds. No, right? Said, now becoming a bit impatient. I told you it was pointed, not like those. 
And then I showed him 399. Next slide, please. There it is. No, that's just like the others, Wright said. I told you it was pointed. He then reached into his desk and retrieved the projectile that we'd been using with Tomlinson earlier that day to simulate the finding of the bullet. He held it between his thumb and his forefinger and he said, like this one, pointed, like this hunting round. I asked him if I could keep the bullet. He said, sure. And that night back at the hotel, I, I photographed it with the Polaroid camera. Next slide. As you can see, I put a hotel key beside it. There's the, there's the round to, get it, to give a sense of scale. So we left his office and we rejoined the others. And a bit later, we were all standing around together and Wright said, pointing to the photo of 399, uh, uh, allowed once again that it didn't resemble the bullet that he'd gotten from Tomlinson. And still later, while we were just getting ready to leave the hospital, Wright pulled me aside. Mr. Thompson, he asked, uh, that last bullet photo you showed me, the one they say I had? I answered, yeah. Wright kept looking at me for a few seconds, but he didn't say anything. And a few minutes later, we left the hospital. I never saw Wright again. Well, as I walked away from Parkland Hospital with Patsy Swank, I knew that what I just learned, if true, would have momentous consequences. For I knew that from the time the bullet left Wright's hands, it was in government possession. If what Wright had said, if, if what he told me is correct, 399 had been substituted for the Tomlinson Wright bullet while it was in government custody. There was a paper trail which led from Wright all the way to the FBI lab in Washington. Now we've got a typed note from Secret Service agent Richard Johnson. Next slide, please. Uh, there's the note. And you note, on the note, you've got a reference to the bullet. And down here, you've got unsigned Richard E. Johnson, special agent, 7.30 p.m. That's in Washington on November 22nd. The attached expended bullet will read it, right? So upon reaching Washington on Air Force One with the bullet in his pocket, Johnson passed the bullet on to Chief James Rowley of the Secret Service, his boss of bosses. Rowley, in turn, passed it on to FBI agent Elmer Todd, who delivered it to Robert Fra Frazier at the FBI lab, and this is all covered with paper. According to Todd's report, the envelope and its contents, finally the bullet gets out of his pocket, out of Johnson's pocket, through Rowley and into an envelope. Uh, the envelope and its contents were taken to the FBI lab, says Todd, where the envelope was opened, and the initials of both Todd and Frazier were etched on the nose of the bullet. In addition, we've got an FBI lab receipt pointing out that Q1, which was the name of the bullet, found on stretcher was received from Special Agent Elmer Todd on 1122. Okay, so you've got a paper trail from November 22nd. In late May 1964, as would be expected, the Warren Commission asked the FBI to establish a chain of custody for many pieces of physical evidence, including C1, which is the FBI title for the bullet. Um, I was also aware, as I left Parkland, of the general failure of this attempt to establish a chain of evidence. Here's what we got. On June 2nd, 29 pieces of evidence, including C1, are shipped to the Dallas field office. On June 17th, the Dallas field office sends an air tell back to Washington referencing the commission's request and stating that investigation in Dallas should be completed two days later on the 19th of June. The air tell also told the director that because, quote, 
rifle bullet C1, not positively identified Dallas. This will necessitate, this is telegraphic language, not identified Dallas. This will necessitate exhibiting to Special Agent Richard Johnson, Secret Service, and James Rowley, Chief Secret Service, as well as possibly to FBI agents Elmer Lee Todd and Robert A. Frazier in Washington. In other words, we couldn't, we couldn't identify it, so oops, we're shipping it back to Washington. You guys are going to have to do some work there on it. The Airtel went on to recommend that C1 or C, CE399 uh, would then be drawn by agents from the, the lab and uh, exhibited where necessary. Now later in June, Todd and Frazier did positively identify Commission Exhibit 399 as the bullet they'd handled on the 22nd because they'd inscribed their initials on it. Easy. However, when Todd showed the bullet to Chief Rowley and to Agent Johnson, neither was able to identify it. All we have on that is the bland statement of an FBI air tell, quote, on June 24th, Special Agent Richard Johnson and James Rowley, Chief United States Secret Service, advised Special Agent Elmer Todd that they were unable to identify rifle bullet C1 by inspection. Of the six people who handled the bullet on its way to the FBI lab, only two, Todd and Frazier, were able to positively identify it. Tomlinson, Wright, Johnson, and Rowley failed to positively identify it. But look, was this failure really due to the obvious fact that no one in the transmission chain upstream of Todd and Frazier had bothered to inscribe their initials on the bullet? In other words then, is the failure simply a technical failure? Does positive mean positively identify it because it's got my damned initials on it so I can do it? And if I don't have that, I can't positively identify it. Is that what all this means? Well, we've got an FBI letterhead memorandum dated July 7th, 1964, which makes it appear that the failure of Tomlinson and Wright to identify the bullet was only a failure on technical grounds. Next slide, please. Here we go. Here are the operative phrases. And I'm just going to leave this up for a while. Note, Tomlinson stated, first of all, shown by Bardwell D. Odom, a rifle slug is shown. Get that? By Bardwell Odom to Daryl Thomason. Thomason stated that it appears to be the same one he found on a hospital carriage at Parkland. Same one, okay? Same day, O.P. Wright, Bardwell D. Odom, shows him exhibit C1, right? And O.P. Wright says, looks like the slug found at Parkland Hospital on November 22nd. All right? Well, this document would seem to resolve the question. Tomlinson and Wright are shown the bullet by an FBI agent in June of 1964, and they both confirm, hey, looks like the bullet they handled in 1963. They cannot positively identify it because they failed to inscribe their initials on it. But it looks like the same bullet. Yeah, close enough for government work. Yep, well, at least that's what I thought as I left Parkland and hopped in Patsy Swank's car for the trip back to the hotel. Wright has got something garbled in his head about the appearance of that bullet, I said to myself. And it was for that reason that I didn't put this in the text in six seconds, I put it in a footnote with a photograph of the bullet because it didn't seem to me to really make it. Given this sort of documentary evidence, it seemed to me, ah, right, even if, I didn't know then he was deputy chief of police, for God's sakes, but he made a mistake with what I thought. Okay, so one thing led to another, and I was never evil, either inclined or managed to follow up on this, but some 35 years later, Gary Aguilar, sitting right down here, piqued my interest in this issue. Now, I would like to point out that Gary is one of the most tenacious and intelligent students in this case. And he, on his own hook, decided to follow up on Special Agent Bardwell D. Odom's visit to Parkland Hospital. So, 
Gary thought to himself correctly, look, there has to be some paper behind this, this memo. The, the FBI, when they go to the bathroom, they write a 302, right? I mean, 302s are all over the, are all over the place. I had, in the Oklahoma bombing, I had 28,000 FBI 302s in my laptop. So 302s are all over the place. There should be some 302s on this. Well, so Gary first asked Kathy Cunningham to have a look through the archives to see what she could turn up. She turned up zip. He then wrote to Steve Tilley. You all know Steve Tilley at the archives. And uh, asked them to do a search. Months, 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 months. Everybody tries every angle that the archivist and their assistants can figure out. And they come up blank. No 302s, no initial interview reports of this. Gary even goes to the FBI and asks them if, you know, by any chance, folks, you might have left a few documents back there and didn't turn them over to the archives. That didn't work. He goes to Jeremy Gunn. Anyhow, all these inquiries come to a dead end. Apparently, there are no documents backing up the showing of this bullet to these two dudes in Parkland Hospital on June 12, 1964. Well, that's a very odd situation in itself. So Gary told me of the dry hole that he had drilled, and I suggested we ask Bardwell D. Odom what happened and find out if he wrote a report on this. Well, Bardwell D. Odom, that is one truly unusual name. So I had him in about 15 minutes, right? And Bard Odom had retired from the FBI in 1968 and worked as a lawyer ever since. Gary sent him some documents, and, uh, and then Gary telephoned him. Bard Odom is 83, and he had a few infirmities. He had macular degeneration, your eyes, which gave him very good reason and a big desire to talk to Gary, right? Diabetes a broken hip a few years before, but look, as Gary pointed out at the time, th this guy was sharp as a tack, and he was. So at the very outset of the call, Gary says to him, quote, one of the documents said that Bardwell Odom, to wit, you, right, took this bullet around and showed it to a couple of people at Parkland Hospital. Odom's reply was direct and electrifying. I didn't show it to anybody at Parkland Hospital. I didn't have any bullet. I don't know where you got that, but it's wrong. You're talking about the bullet they found at Parkland? I don't think I ever saw it even. Well, after they talked a bit about macular degeneration, <laughs> Odom, not Gary, turns the conversation back to Parkland Hospital and he says, but, but, turning the conference, but back to Parkland Hospital, I never saw that bullet. I recall that somebody found it on a stretcher that JF Key was brought into the hospital with. Huh. Well, there was some confusion in this interview as to when all this occurred, so Gary and I were going to Dallas anyhow for the usual festivities a, a couple years ago. And so we arranged to go out and interview Odom face to face in November 2001. And uh, he's, he proved to be a great guy, alert and funny, and uh, had a sharp memory of his days in the FBI. And, and the, the one bad thing was, it was disappointing to learn that he hadn't, because of the macular degeneration dummies, <laughs> he hadn't been able to read the papers that we had sent him, right? So, but we got over that, and uh, he continued to be adamant that he'd never seen, he'd never had C1 or 399 in his hands. It had never been in his custody, and he had no recollection of ever visiting Parkland Hospital to interview either O.P. Wright, whom he knew, because O.P. Wright was deputy chief, right? Uh, or Daryl Tomlinson. He didn't recall doing anything connected with the Kennedy assassination in June 64. And had he taken the bullet to show Wright and Tomlinson, as he pointed out, I would have done a report on it. Of course, right? right? Two days later, he tried to reach Gary and me in our hotel and missed. And two days later, he, he, I got a message that he called, so I called him back. And he said that after thinking about it, he now had a vague recollection 
of sitting in Wright's basement office at Parkland, Parkland talking to Wright about some unknown, in inconsequential matter. He still had no recollection of ever having the bullet in his possession or of showing it to anyone. But the more I thought about it, said Odom, I did remember being in his office. The visit that I had with Wright, I didn't consider it important. We didn't talk about it for more than a couple minutes, and I really can't remember what we talked about. But from what you're saying, I might have had the bullet. That must have been what it was. I'm trying to pull it all together. Okay. Now, if this were any ordinary criminal case I was working on, I'd report back that this was clearly an instance of a witness changing his story to accord with a more orthodox account. The key is in Odom's statement. That must have been what it was. Having tumbled to what the inquiry from Aguilar and Thompson is all about, Odom is shifting his story to accord with the orthodox account. In the same phone call, he remarked, the Warren Commission had sent down a request to do this or do that, and we didn't question it. We did whatever they wanted. And I can remember being in Wright's office for an unknown reason sometime well after the assassination. We talked a little about the assassination. I visited with him. I don't remember that I had the bullet with me, but assuming that what you have is correct, it was undoubtedly sealed in a plastic envelope and I didn't open it. He didn't open it. Nobody opened it. We were looking at it through a plastic envelope. And that's my guess. And I just report, no, they couldn't identify it. Well, at first, Odom could not recall, could, could recall no interview with Wright and was clear he'd never seen 399. Now, understanding what our inquiry is about, he recalls, quote, being in Wright's office for an unknown reason transmutes the unknown reason into a visit to show him CE 399 and even imagines them both looking at the bullet through a plastic envelope. Odom has simply imagined what has to be the case for the July 7th letterhead memorandum to be correct. He has adjusted his memory to accord with that memorandum. Well, this is not the only case where things change around CE 399. A similar uh, change may have occurred with regard to another chapter. A decade after I talked to Wright in his basement office, a new witness to the discovery of the bullet appeared. His name was and is Nathan Burgess Poole. He surfaced in January 1977 to the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Poole worked for Otis Elevator in Dallas on November 22nd, and he was sent over to Parkland by his boss in case there were any problems with the elevators. Now Poole is wearing overalls with Otis, so he's pretty obvious, and he was there because other Parkland personnel in their memos submitted to Price right after the shooting mention an Otis elevator guy. So I don't think there's any question that he was there. He got to the hospital shortly after one and went to the emergency area where he met Daryl Tomlinson who was running the elevator. He knew Tomlinson from the, he would visit Parkland every week for maintenance, right? So he knew Tomlinson and together they functioned as a kind of two-man elevator crew. They stood in front of the elevator in the emergency area near a gurney that was sort of canted out from the wall. And one or the other pushed the gurney and when it hit the wall, Poole heard a click, right? He looks down, reaches down to the floor and picks up a bullet which he hands to Tomlinson. Uh, a Secret Service agent is standing right over there, 10 feet away. Tomlinson gave the bullet to the Secret Service agent, says Poole. And after giving the bullet to the Secret Service agent, Tomlinson told Poole that it fell off Governor Connolly's stretcher. Hmm. Well, Almost everything Poole says is directly at odds with what we know from other witnesses concerning the finding of the bullet. Until Poole's appearance, we had believed that Tomlinson was alone when he found the bullet. 
According to both Tomlinson and Wright, Tomlinson found the bullet lying just inside the rim of the gurney's top. Remember that slide with the pad on the top of the gurney, metal gurney, and it's right by the pad. Tomlinson calls Wright over, and Wright picked up the bullet from the gurney, and after some searching, Wright then finds the Secret Service agent, Richard Johnson, to give it to. And during questioning by Council Inspector, Tomlinson said the bullet was found not on Connolly's gurney, but on another one that turns out to be unconnected to the case. Okay, Poole says he held the bullet in his hand, right? Poole held the bullet in his hand. What did it look like? Poole's first contact with the committee was a phone call on January 12th, 1977, from Staff Counsel Belford Lawson. Uh, Lawson didn't tape the phone call, but we have his three-page memo. Next slide, please. Okay. Now notice, this is the memo, right? Untaped telephone interview. Poole heard an object fall from the stretcher. Poole bent over to pick it up and discovered a bullet. Based on his familiarity with guns, he judged it to be a 6 mm less than 30, 30 the bullet as bronze, long, oops, pointed, pointed, folks, right? And smooth and didn't look like it had hit anything. Well, <laughs> The House Committee moved with its, its usual uh, celerity in this and deposed Poole actually 18 months later, a year and a half later, by which time, in the intervening time, the bullet has lost its pointed tip. Poole now described the bullet as, quote, more like a six millimeter or more a European style bullet, more round nose than a 303 or a 30 out six or anything like that. He also pointed out that it was small and the length was long. It didn't look like it had hit bone or anything like that. It looked like it probably was a jacketed bullet. In short, Poole is describing CE 399. Well, the provenance of this damn bullet becomes even murkier if we follow a lead offered in John Connolly's book that was published in 1993 and is entitled In History's Shadow. Connolly, or his ghostwriter, remarks, quote, when they rolled me off the stretcher and onto the examining table, a metal object fell onto the floor with a click no louder than a wedding band. The nurse picked it up and slipped it into her pocket. It was the bullet from my body. Henry Wade, district attorney of Dallas at the time, in a 93 Dallas Morning News interview corroborates um, Connolly's claim. Quote, Connolly was in the operating room. Some nurse had a bullet in her hand and said this was on the gurney that Connolly was on. I told her to give it to the police. Now, Wade said this encounter happened around 4 p.m., long after the Kennedy party had left the hospital, long after Agent Johnson had left the hospital, with 399 supposedly tucked safely in his pocket. These reports from Wade and Connolly have to be weighed against the testimony of the two nurses involved, Jeanette Standridge and Jane Wester, who both reported neither finding anything or hearing anything like this. Uh, Council Spector specifically asked Standridge if she noticed a bullet or heard the sound of anything falling. She answered no to both questions. O.P. Wright, actually, was married to the directress of nursing, uh, Elizabeth Wright, at the time. And we have her very long 10-page typed report in the price exhibit in the 26 volumes. In this report, Elizabeth Wright describes taking people, including District Attorney Wade, in to see Mrs. Connolly, offering some further corroboration for this. Well, in 1993, Elizabeth Wright, who was by that time the widow of O.P. Wright, was interviewed by Wallace Milam. He described her then as very pleasant, and she was even inquiring about this herself. She was well-educated and well-bred, says Wallace Milam. Milam read to Elizabeth Wright Wade's report, and she volunteered that she had been the nurse who had shown the bullet to Wade. She asked Milam, do you want to see it? <laughs> 
When he allowed that he did, she produced a small ceramic container from which she extracted an unfired 38 Special WCC revolver bullet. She insisted that her husband, O.P. Wright, had given her the bullet and that she had shown it to, OP, to, to Henry Wade. She also reca recalled that bullets were found on several stretchers in the days after the assassination and that Doris Nelson, a nursing supervisor at Parkland, had said, quote, I wish they would stop putting bullets on these stretchers, close quote. <laughs> right? Now, this last remark might stand as an epitaph over any serious attempt to determine the provenance of Commission Exhibit 399. I wish they would stop putting bullets on these stretchers. I had to laugh when I read this. It seemed to mock the rather simple project that I'd set for myself. Look, I had nothing very complicated in mind, and it's all Gary Aguilar's fault anyhow. I had no interest in entering the field of battle concerning NAA examination of the bullet or considering the vexed question as to why no human tissue was on it when it reached the FBI lab, for which the answer is obviously dummy Johnson carried it in his pocket instead of putting it in an envelope, evidence envelope. I hadn't even gotten to, to the real question as to which gurney was it found on, right? All I'd simply wanted to answer was the obvious question any criminal investigator would ask first out. Is the bullet we've got here in evidence the one that was found at Parkland Hospital? Instead of finding a direct answer to that simple question, I end, almost, end up almost buried under a host of subsidiary questions. If Connolly and Wade are correct, a bullet that came out of Connolly's body was still at Parkland Hospital at 4 p.m. That bullet could not possibly be the Tomlinson Wright, Johnson Rowley, Todd Frazier bullet, that is CE 399, that left Parkland much earlier. But is the Todd Frazier bullet, the one marked with their initials on the night of the 22nd, the one later designated C1 or CE 399, is that bullet the same one that was handled by Tomlinson, Wright, Johnson, Rowley? As we've seen, Wright says no. Wright's claim that the bullet he handled was like this one, pointed, stands incandescent in my memory. Did Bardwell Odom show him 399 in June of 1964? And did Wright state that 399 looked like the bullet he handled on the 22nd? I don't think so, but I'm not certain. Or did some other agent show Wright 399 and elicit that response? I don't think so, but I'm not certain. What did Poole mean on the phone when Counsel Lawson wrote down that he described the bullet as pointed? We don't even know if pointed is Poole's word or Lawson's word, because Lawson didn't tape the call and all we have is his paraphrase. And what are we to make of the fact that, according to Poole, the bullet was given by Tomlinson directly to a Secret Service agent? Poole knew O.P. Wright and mentions that on that day, Wright cleared him past Secret Service security to get into the emergency area. Yet according to Poole, Wright was not in the transmission chain, which gets the bullet from the stretcher to Washington. If Poole is correct, Wright never had his hands on the bullet. Traditionally, <clears throat> a talk like this ends with the speaker tying up the mystery with an elegantly crafted bow ribbon, <laughs> right? He pulls out of his pocket a newly discovered fact which resolves the problem or performs some logical acrobatics to the same end. My intent, folks, is just the opposite. I don't think there is any solution to this little mystery concerning the provenance of CE 399. Back in 66, based on incomplete facts and only a cursory investigation, 
I believe the right was wrong and that 399 was the bullet he passed on to Agent Richard Johnson. No longer do I believe this. Now I honestly, I don't know what to believe. 35 years has only made the mystery more recalcitrant. Three and one half decades have not brought clarity, but rather obscurity to this rather simple, rather obvious part of the fact pattern in the case. This whole case is like this, folks. Everywhere you look, you pull on any single thread, any single fact and you're soon besieged with a tangle of subsidiary questions. My unsuccessful hunt for the provenance of 399 can therefore be taken as a kind of parable for the case as a whole. Like so many other elements in this case, the passage of time has not brought clarity, but rather only widening confusion. I can tell you from personal experience, and Cyril can too, that this is not the way a murder case develops. In fact, it's unique in my experience. I've worked on several hundred murder cases over the last 25 years, a few working for the family, but most often working as a defense investigator for the, for the accused. In one of these cases, the Oklahoma City bombing uh, resembled the Kennedy assassination in terms of the gigantic, massive government investigation. Yet, all my experience in all these cases yields a single conclusion, teaches a single lesson. At the end of a thorough investigation, there may often be questions as to why a certain person carried out a particular crime. The vagaries of the human spirit abound. There may sometimes be questions concerning who carried out a particular crime. There are, in fact, in the world, whodunits. But there is almost never a question as to what happened. The more you investigate a case, the more clearly you come to understand what happened. The Kennedy assassination is unique in my experience and that here, precisely the opposite is true. The more the case is investigated, the less one knows about what really happened. Go figure. Thank you. Bye-bye.